And now today's featured speaker is Ari Warsawski, class of 2009. Ari currently works as an aviation advisor at XO, where he consults with clients on their private jet charter needs. Beyond the part 135 charter space, Ari has extensive experience across both general aviation, part 91, and airline, part 121, flight operations. He is a certified airline transport pilot, gold seal flight instructor, and has piloted aircraft ranging from single engine Cessnas to Embraer E-175 transport category jets. He has trained and mentored over 40 students and is a volunteer pilot with the charitable organization Above the Clouds. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming Ari. Thank you, Ari. Thanks, Emily, and a pleasure to, uh, you know, thanks for having me today, and it's a really big pleasure to be here amongst my, you know, fellow alumni and parents of uh, current students, um, sharing a, a topic that I'm probably most passionate about, uh, aviation. So uh, thanks again for joining, um, and let's get started. Um, today, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you are going to understand the ins and outs of flying private, and have a very good foundation, whether you've never flown before, or maybe you've flown a handful of times, about what's involved in, in, uh, in flying private, the different ways to go about doing it, and sort of, you know, different questions to ask along the way. So without further ado, let's get to my favorite question that everybody asks as soon as they hear that I'm in charter sales. How much does it cost to charter a private jet? Next slide. So if you wanna go on the number one route in the country by private aviation from New York to Miami, number one most popular, uh, it's going to cost you $12,000. You take a Phenom 300 light jet aircraft, it's going to fit six of your closest friends and you, and you can get from New York to Miami for $12,000. That exact same route, New York to Miami, in a Gulfstream, is probably going to run you around $38,000. Two and a half hour flight, maybe you can take a, more, a few more friends, but your cost has just gone up by about $20,000. Exact same route in a Citation XLS, a fantastic mid-size aircraft, it's only going to be $7,500, which sounds like a steal, except the flight leaves tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, and it's a non-refundable flight. So be early or you're going to lose your money. That exact same flight on a Citation 10 is going to be $18,000. But if you leave two days earlier, you can actually save $2,000, only sixteen. dollars And last but not least, your friend is offering up his airplane. Look, you need it for the weekend. Take it. It's $10,000. Go for it. Uh, by the way, it's an illegal charter. So... What I want to show you and demonstrate here is that this is a very complex industry. There's a lot of different ways to fly. There's a lot of different aircraft, a lot of variables that go into the pricing. And just because it's a good price doesn't mean it's a good value, doesn't mean it's a safe, uh, safe flight. So as I mentioned today, we're going to cover all the nuts and bolts of aviation. And hopefully by the end of this, you really have a good firm grasp um, to take your next steps in flying private. Uh, or if you're just you know, a connoisseur or, or just a, a, an aviation enthusiast, this will hopefully open the door to what happens behind the scenes in, uh, in our world. So here's what we're gonna to cover today. We're gonna to start off with the four different ways to fly private. Um, as mentioned, there are different ways to get into this industry, chartering a whole aircraft ownership, we'll cover that. We'll talk about the difference between operators and brokers and what each of these terms means and entails. We'll talk about the sources of aircraft, where they all come from. We'll discuss how to pick an aircraft for a flight, what's an appropriate aircraft for each flight mission, um, and how are flights priced? I know that's a big question we got uh, ahead of time. So we're gonna break down all the elements and show you what goes into the total cost of, a, of an individual flight. Next, we're gonna talk about evaluating programs. There are hundreds and hundreds of operators, brokers, jet cards, memberships, fractional ownership programs. Um, we're gonna cover some of the main benefits uh, that each one of these offers. And when you evaluate these programs, what type of questions do you wanna ask? Um, and what are the caveats for you know, each of these programs? Um, the two most important subjects I'm, I'm saving for the end, um, that is gonna be safety. Um, which is the most important thing above all when selecting uh, you know, an operator for a private jet flight, and also how to protect yourself. Um, everyone has horror stories of how they've lost you know, $15,000 on a non-cancellationable flight, or how they've put up money for an account and the company just disappeared overnight. Um, so how can you pr uh, protect yourselves, your finances, your friends, your loved ones, um, you know, both on the flight and everything surrounding these programs? And then last but not least, we're going to open up for questions. Um, just to set uh, timing expectations, expecting probably about 30 to 40 minutes for my portion, and then we'll uh, you know, leave the rest for questions. So let's take it away. There are four major ways to fly private. 
On one end of the spectrum, you have full aircraft ownership. I'm going to go, you know, cough up $30 million. I'm going to buy a beautiful Challenger 300. I'm going to, you know, put it under a management company. I'm going to pay for pilots, put four pilots on staff, pay maintenance, you know, all the such. Um, benefit of this, I have total control over my aircraft. It's just like you have your car, you're not renting it out. When you want to go, you go. Next to that, we have what's called fractional ownership. Maybe this is like four or five people who all come in and buy an airplane together or their fractional ownership programs where they will um, you know, acquire the aircraft, find all the people to go into it. And uh, essentially the way that it works is you put a capital deposit down, you know, 500,000, 1 million, 2 million. You get a share of that aircraft, a lot of number of hours per year, and you pay per hour, usually at a lower rate. Jet cards and memberships. This is kind of the best of both worlds. This is very little strings attached, a very low capital investment, maybe um, something in the ballpark of $50,000 to $200,000, maybe sometimes more up to half a million. Um, but what's nice about this is that you are not sinking money into a depreciating asset, um, but you have access in many cases to a lot of the benefits that come with ownership, you know, guaranteed availability on an aircraft, flexible cancellation terms, um, but you're still putting money on account. On the furthest end of it, you have an independent broker. And this is me calling a broker and I say, you know, hey, Mr. Broker, I need to go from New York to Miami tomorrow. Six of my friends, can you find me an aircraft? They're going to go call a bunch of people, come back with a quote. You wire $20,000 for the flight, and that's it. You walk away. Um, typically, to go into the fractional ownership, you're flying at least 150 hours a year and have a need for tax deduction. Um, if you don't have either of those, these are probably going to be your better options. Um, as I mentioned, jet cards and memberships, a little bit more, you know, going to put some money up on account, but much more benefits independent brokers, very little strings attached, but you know, you're flying on an as-need basis. In the industry, you're going to come across two major terms. You're going to hear operators and you're going to hear brokers. And it's very important to understand the differentiation between these two. An operator maintains operational control of the aircraft. They hire the pilots, they perform the maintenance, they vet the, uh, the flight plan, uh, they, you know, verify the risk assessment, make sure that the, uh, it's a safe plan on a safe aircraft, everything is good to go and it's gonna be a, a safe flight. They also have authority on whether they start or terminate the flight. So they can say this is a no-go and there's nothing else anyone can say about this. Um, on the other hand, you have brokers. Brokers do not own aircraft. They do not have an operational control. All that they do is they're gonna go call a bunch of operators they're going to find the best one for the mission. They're going to negotiate a price on your behalf. Um, and then they're going to come back to you and present three or four options and say, you know, which one do you want to go with? At that point, they may facilitate the entire transaction or they may pass you directly off to the operator to sign a, a direct contract with the operator and they'll step out of the picture altogether. There is a little bit of an intersection here that I want to talk about because there are another, a number of companies, um, my company included XO, where our group owns a fleet of aircraft, but we also broker to third party operators as well. Um, this is a nice sweet spot for a lot of companies because it, uh, and you're going to see that in the jet card and the membership world, because they will have a lot more control over um, sourcing aircraft and getting good rates, but they also give the flexibility to search the public market for the best rates possible. So once again, operators own the aircraft, typically manage the aircraft, maintain operational control, brokers find operators and pair you up with them. Where do airplanes come from? You're going to come across two different categories of aircraft. You see chartered fleets, um, and you're going to see individually owned aircraft. A chartered fleet, um, companies such as XO, such as Wheels Up, such as NetJets, you know, or these uh, you know, large organizations, they're going to own fleets of dozens, hundreds of aircraft that are just going around the country on charter flights. Um, these are the great thing about them is that they're, is that they're either based or they're what's called floating. A floating fleet has no home. The airplane lives wherever it landed last. So in our specific case, where we have a fleet of 40 some odd super mid aircraft that float around the country, um, they may pick up a customer in the morning in Boston. They may bring them down to Miami. The airplane may sit overnight in Miami, take another customer to Montana, overnight in Montana, et cetera. Um, great thing about that is you're not paying repositioning fees. I'll get to that later on. With a based airplane, you know, maybe it lives out in Las Vegas, it's always going to come and have to come home at night. So you're always paying the repositioning at the end, uh, generally speaking, to get that airplane back home. On the bottom side of here, you have owned aircraft. Um, a great example of this is um, Alarion Aviation out in Farmingdale, New York. Um, they are a management company. They don't own any aircraft themselves, but owners will take their aircraft. They're going to manage it by this Part 135 operator. Um, who takes care of the maintenance, they hire the pilots, they manage the aircraft. The owner flies the aircraft when they need it, 
And when they don't need it, they charter it out. So you'll see it on the public market. These are typically based aircraft. So as I mentioned, you're typically gonna have to pay to get the aircraft back home to the operator. Um, and on top of that, they typically require owner approval. So you may hear about that. Um, a broker may come and say, hey, we have this aircraft, it's a great aircraft. Before we sign off on it, we just need owner approval for the flight. So if you like the price, you like the routing, we'll go back and check. Um, so once again, charter fleets based or floating. Floating fleets go around the country, based fleets have a home. Owned aircraft owned by an individual charter when it's not in use usually requires approval. Now there is always a third place that airplanes come from, and that is your friend. Everyone's got that one friend who has an airplane. And if you don't have a friend who doesn't have an airplane, you gotta get new friends. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is John Travolta's house, casually parking his 707 in the outside of his living room. Um, and this enters the realm of what we're gonna discuss as uh, illegal charter operations. Um, how do you avoid an illegal charter operation? Even has been pop, these have been popping up um, rapidly throughout the last few years, and the FAA is trying to you know close them up and avoid them, but they, they're still um, somewhat prevalent. Um, you're going to hear two terms in this industry: Part 91, Part 35. These are parts of the federal aviation regulations um, that deal with the rules and regulations surrounding each one of these types of flights. Part 91, think of it as the rules of the road. This it covers all aircraft from a single engine Cessna all the way up to a Delta 740 or 777. Nope, no, uh, we'll call it Delta 767. They still have those going. Um, part 91 talks about you know, the requirements to fly the airplane, it talks about you know, the rules of the road, who's flying when, uh, what happens during night versus day. Um, and every single airplane that operates in US airspace is subject to these Part 91 rules. That being said, you cannot sell an aircraft charter under part 91. If I own my own aircraft, I can go fly around and be, be beholden only to the part 91 rules. The minute I'm gonna take a stranger and put him on my aircraft and I'm gonna sell that flight, I'm beholden to the part 135 rules. These are far more stringent. They're gonna uh, specify the level of pilots that are able to fly under this. They're gonna talk about the currency requirements for the pilots. They're gonna talk about the maintenance requirements and frequency that the aircraft has to undergo. Um, the safety management systems put in place by the operator. The whole purpose of this is to make is for safety. That's the whole thing that it comes down to. It's making sure that if you are purchasing a flight, you can have a level of comfort knowing that it is beholden to a higher set of standards than a part 91 operation. And just to wrap up on this subject, if your friend has an aircraft and he gives you a great rate, says, yeah, $5,000, take it to the Bahamas, go for it. On takeoff, you lose an engine, the, the airplane crashes off the end of the runway. Um, two things are going to happen. You know, number one, hopefully everyone's okay. Number one, insurance is going to look at this. You know, let's say the pilots were talking to the FAA and they said, yeah, we were paying for you know, this flight. This guy was paying 40 something owner. Um, FAA talks to the insurance company. Insurance one is not going to probably cover this. There'll be a gap in coverage because this was a 135 flight, you know, not operated, oper operated illegally. So someone's going to be holding to a $20 million bill. And second is your friend is going to have to deal with whatever legal repercussions uh, come out of this for operating a legal charter. So once again, if you are looking to use a friend's airplane, would highly avoid it uh, whenever possible. Go with a certified 135 charter operator. All right, enough of that fun stuff. Let's talk about airplanes. Um, so how do you select a private jet aircraft? There's a lot of aircraft in the industry. And normally when people think about private uh, aviation, they think about private jets, they're thinking about this aircraft here. Uh, this is a Gulfstream G4 that you're looking at right now. Um, this is what people think of when they're like, oh yeah, we're taking a private jet around, it's a G4. Well, not always. Um, there are typically six categories of aircraft you're gonna come across. Turboprops, lights, mids, super mids, heavy, and ultra long range. These are the six basic categories that we talk about when we, um, when we discuss uh, you know, different flights. Hey, I'm looking for a light jet to go from um, you know, New York down to Atlanta. I'm looking for a mid size to go down to Oklahoma. I'm looking for a super mid to go across the country. Um, so you're going to hear these six terms come very frequently as you go through the industry. Uh, let's dive into each one of these in a little more detail. Turboprop, uh, these are going to be your Pilatus PC-12s as shown. Uh, these are great, super efficient, cost-efficient aircraft. Turboprops are very low operating costs, so you can get a great price on them. Typically good for flights less than about 500 miles. So for those of you who are going from, you know, the Hamptons up to the Nantucket, or you're going um, up in the Northeast, super great option to get a few people around uh, at a cost-efficient option. They can also land, land in very short runways. So if you're trying to go to, you know, that uh, ski resort that's way out, you know, in northern Maine, there's a tiny little airport next to it, could be a great option for you. Next up from that, we have our light jets. Now we're talking an actual, from a turboprop to an actual jet. Um, these are not going to be full stand-up cabins. Think of something that's kind of like a sardine can, you know, maybe four and three-quarter ceiling height, um, you know, 
the small cabin, tight, maybe six seats, but you're stuffed in there. Very limited uh, luggage capacity, but a very efficient way to get around. Um, super great if you're a on a budget or two, um, just need to take a short business trip and do a quick turnaround, you know, morning and night. Um, I also want to point out these operating costs. Look at the range, you know, all the way from 35 to 65. This isn't even a hard rule. Um, you'll see some private jets, light jets go for, you know, $8,000 an hour. Um, we're going to get into uh, the pricing in just a little bit, but just want to point out the range. Next up, we talk about our midsize aircraft. This is going to be similar missions to the light jet. You know, maybe you're going up and down the coast, maybe you're going halfway across the country. Definitely can't go coast to coast in these without a fuel stop, but now we have a larger cabin. Um, shown here is a Citation Excel. You know, you're going to fit nice seven passengers in the aircraft. It'll be a little more comfortable, you know, a little more arm room. Um, but once again, you're going to have that limit on range and capacity. Next up, we're looking at the Super Mid. Up here is shown a Challenger 300 aircraft. It's a beautiful aircraft, uh, fits nine passengers. You have a couch. Um, you're going all the way coast to coast at a fuel stop. It's a really great experience. Seven feet wide, six foot ceilings. You know, it's, it's a great stand up experience. But the price you can see it keeps going higher and higher, you know, north of $10,000 an hour for one of these one of these birds. Um, second to last, we have our heavy category. Now we're back up to the G6, the G, uh, G4s, G5s. Um, you're going to be fitting, you know, the, the family, the kids, the wife, the bikes, everything. If it fits, it flies. Um, upwards of probably 12 to 14 seats in these. Um, pretty high operating costs, not to say you can't find a deal, but these are going to be great for large, large uh, passenger counts or if you're going extended ranges. And for that fringe case where you have to go all the way from New York to Singapore, the Challenger 7,005, sorry, the uh, Global 7500 is your aircraft. Um, up to about 16 passengers in ultra long range aircraft. You can see they convert to beds. This one has a library on board because that's the VistaJet experience you're going to get. Um, but once again, if you're going all the way across the world, that's where you're going to see these ultra long range aircraft. Operating costs, you know, all the way up north of 15, maybe more, uh, thousand dollars per hour. Uh, so beyond the aircraft category, there's a number of other uh, factors and caveats I want to bring to your attention when you think about this. So you're going to be speaking with brokers, you'll be speaking with your membership programs, and they'll be recommending different aircraft to you. The more information you give them, the better they can guide you on the appropriate aircraft for the mission. The first is a category, um, just as we discussed, you want to make sure you're not sold on a smaller uh, category aircraft. I see a lot of clients come to me saying, hey, I'm on a super, super tight budget. What can you get for me? Um, you know, you're always inclined to say, well, we have a great light jet option, but if they're bringing, you know, a surfboard and seven other friends, you're not going to stuff it in there. So just to make sure that you know the aircraft category you're being put in. Next is, will it fit? Um, kind of building off that category, just because it has, you know, six seats or seven seats doesn't mean the baggage capacity is really big. I think of a Hawker 800 midsize aircraft. You can fit seven people in there, no problem, but the baggage compartment is like this tiny little 50 cubic feet space. So important to know, you know, if you're bringing a lot of luggage, you know, great, you can fit the passengers, might not be a great aircraft for you. Um, and also, what's the range? You know, will you have to do a fuel stop or not? Uh, once again, the way to avoid this, make sure you tell your broker advisor up front, um, you know, as much information as possible about what is coming on board. Next, let's talk about the year. I, ha I hear a lot of clients who don't want to fly an order older aircraft and perfectly understandable. Um, two key terms to know, year of make, year of refurbishment. Um, a 2010, um, you know, Citation 10 might be in a far worse condition than a 1990 Gulfstream G4 that was refurbished in 2020. So it's always important to ask when was the year made and when was it refurbished? Because you can end up in an aircraft from 1999 that looks brand new and has that new aircraft smell. Um, and on top of that, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but um, more than more so than age, when talking about safety, I care about the maintenance being done on the aircraft and the regular schedules. So age does not always correlate with with uh, the quality and condition of the aircraft, but it is certainly something, something to consider and something to ask. Uh, last three cabin configuration, <laughs> the belt is laugh. Let's talk about that. So um, typically these aircraft, you're going to see club seating. You're going to see divans, as shown in um, you know one of the previous. Uh, you can see this little couch off to the side over here. You're going to see club seating, um, and, it, and occasionally you're going to run into the belt and laugh. Um, when you hear seven people in a small, you know, uh, Learjet, consider that one of those might be sitting on a toilet for the duration of the flight. In a lot of these aircraft, the lavatory actually has a leather padded seat that comes down and a seat belt on it. So while your six friends are all having fun drinking, you know, Don Perignon, Don Perignon up front, you're going to be sitting in the back of the toilet <laughs> um, by yourself. So always important to ask, is this a seven-person aircraft and is there a belted lav on the aircraft or is it all up front? 
Um, next is going to be Wi-Fi. Uh, just because your $49 JetBlue flight has Wi-Fi doesn't mean your G6 has Wi-Fi, um, believe it or not. So uh, always important to ask if you need it. Maybe you're going on a business trip and it's important that you're working. Um, will Wi-Fi be available on the flight? And more importantly, the caveat will be available over the water or when going international. Some Wi-Fi is only available domestically. Always nice to ask. Uh, lastly is safety. Number, like the most important. I didn't even put a caveat here because it warrants its own slide, which we'll get to in a little bit. All right, so let's talk about what goes into pricing of a flight. Um, just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's good, doesn't mean it's just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's a good value. So let's kind of break this down um, on, a, on an element by element level. The first thing that goes into the total um, cost of a flight is a type of aircraft. Obviously, a single engine turboprop is going to have a lower operating cost than a G6. Um, that's, you know, a Gulfstream G6, you know, 16 or 14 passengers going across the country. Um, that's the first element. What does it cost to operate this aircraft, the crew, all the such, the safety ratings they have? Second is going to be your duration of flight and the um, any hourly minimums that are associated, sorry about that, associated with it. A lot of operators, it's not worth their time to reposition a large aircraft for a very, very short flight. Every time they power up the engines, every time they call the crew in, they're paying money for it. So sometimes, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of operators will charge hourly uh, daily minimums where they're gonna say, doesn't matter if you're taking a 20 minute flight, we're charging you for two hours of it. And that is how the flight that is 30 minutes can cost the exact same as a flight that's two hours. Um, so duration of flight, longer flights, and if there are any minimums associated with it. Repositioning fee. Uh, so remember when I was talking earlier about floating fleets or based fleets, um, if you have to reposition the aircraft from across the country to pick you up, um, you can pay a higher cost. So let's say, for example, you're trying to book a flight the day before Christmas, you just called in, and the only thing that's available is an aircraft all the way across the country. Um, that same flight could cost significantly more because you're paying for the aircraft to come all the way in. Um, so where's the aircraft coming from? Is it a floating fleet that doesn't have to be necessarily positioned, or is it, you know, getting um, pulled in from somewhere else, or does it have to go somewhere after? You know, international, we see a significant, you know, 20, 30% premium because once you drop off a passenger in Turks and Caicos, that airplane is going to sit there. It's going to go all the way back to the United States. Taxes and fees. Every single flight carries a seven point, uh, every single domestic flight carries a 7.5% federal excise tax, FET. 7.5% um, can add up to several thousand dollars when you're talking about a 20, 30, $40,000 flight. Um, on top of that, you're going to have FBO fees, you're going to have landing fees, ground handling fees, um, a number you know, of fees that will get tacked on to the cost of the flight. Some airports, for example, if you're flying to um, West Hampton, they have, they're notorious for their landing fees as opposed to, as opposed to like Iceland. So, you know, I see a lot of clients who want to go to West Hampton and there's a premium for that versus going to Iceland, which doesn't charge as many landing fees. Uh, De-icing. So, um, if you are, this could be, this can range anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars. If you're doing just a quick spray off of the wings, could be a few hundred. If you have to do, you know, multiple levels of de-icing, you can very easily spend uh, several thousand dollars on de-icing. Um, always important to ask your brokers if there's a chance that it could be, there could be frost or it's, you know, in colder, uh, colder environments. Um, will this be an additional cost or is it included? And lastly, you have ancillary expenses, um, most notably catering. Uh, catering is notoriously expensive in private aviation. Uh, if I was not doing this job, I would go opening a private aviation catering company. Um, we've seen homeless plates go for $300, just to put a put in perspective here. A lot of programs include catering, and a lot of programs will give you catering credits. So always nice to ask. Um, so now that you know the elements, let's talk about the different pricing models you're going to come across in the industry. You're going to see two basic pricing models, dynamic, which is market pricing, fixed hourly rates, where you sign up with a program and it doesn't matter when you're flying, you're always paying the same rates. There's pros and cons to each. Dynamic is very similar to when you're at, um, you're, you're booking a, a flight on Delta and you pull up the grid and you say, oh, if I leave two days earlier, you know, it's a, it's a pretty quiet day and I get a better, better deal on it. Um, this factors in the direct costs of the flight and then factors in demand and you'll see fluctuations for the exact same trip that will range up and down. Fixed hourly rates is when you join a program and they say, you're taking a light jet, it's gonna be 5,500 an hour. You're taking a midsize, it's $7,000 an hour. You're taking a large, you know, a heavy category, it's $10,000 an hour. And then after you take your flight, they're gonna look at the exact hours that you flew. You know, did you get diverted? Did you get weather delayed? And you're gonna get billed for the exact time. Some people love the dynamic pricing model because if they have flexibility in their schedule, they can get really good deals. Um, you leave one day earlier, you save three thousand um, dollars. Or just the routing is best for it. You know, if, if if I see my clients are typically going between Los Angeles, New York, Florida, a lot of the common spots, 
um, this will typically beat out fixed rate pricing. Fixed hourly pricing is nice because it's just it's an it's a known quantity. You're always paying X amount for the same aircraft category. Um, the downside to that is you are always paying a premium rate for it because operators will factor in the worst case scenario, peak travel days, demand you know high demand um, that they might have to go and bring an aircraft from across the country. So you're typically paying a premium hourly rate for these fixed hourly rate programs, um, but it's a known quantity. So when I work with clients, I, we assess their individual flight needs with where their most common routes are, and we figure out which programs are best for them. Um, so as I mentioned, you have the ability to broker, uh, hire a broker for an ad hoc flight, or you can go and you know, buy your own aircraft or a share of an aircraft. The majority of people we see will end up in membership programs, because as I mentioned, they're kind of the best of the both worlds. You get the benefits of the ownership, such as guaranteed availability and recovery, but you don't have to sink you know, $2 million and pay a $25,000 a month uh, just management fee before you're even spending on flights. Um, great for people who are flying you know, two, five, 10 flights a year, um, re really nice programs that are super flexible. Um, there's a lot of really good companies that do this. I listed a few, obviously I work for, uh, for uh, XO over here. Um, these are all other great providers that have their own benefits. Um, you know, and if you're looking for one of them, terrific solutions. Uh, so as I mentioned, these are the common uh, benefits that you're going to hear across each one of these. And it's important to understand what these terms mean and the implications of each one. Guaranteed availability. One of the questions we got was, uh, when, will the, when will the airline, the private jet industry pick up again? It already has. Um, we are seeing, you know, it's, it's incredible to say, I think it's about up 45% year over year. And if you call for a flight tomorrow, it could be very hard to find and source an aircraft. So a lot of these programs will give guaranteed availability where if you call within eight hours, you call within 24 hours, we will guarantee you one of our group fleet's aircraft. Um, guaranteed recovery. This is an insurance policy. Um, for those of you who have ever been on a Delta flight, for example, or JetBlue flight or Spirit, and um, you get on the aircraft and the pilot comes on and says, hey guys, I'm so sorry. We have a mechanical issue with the aircraft. Everyone please deplane. We're gonna go find a new aircraft. Well, Delta operations teams, they're going to go find another aircraft at the airport that's sitting around there because they have a fleet of 300 airplanes sitting around. They're going to taxi it over to the gate and get everyone on. In the private jet space, that is not the case. There's a lot of mom and pop shop brokers who have one or two aircraft, maybe at most. And if that one aircraft goes down, the operator's going to call you and they're going to say, we have no aircraft, you're on your own. And now you're going to, you're in a situation where an irregular operations team is going to be rushing around, scrambling, red alert to go call every operator in the area or see if there's anything on fleet that's available on short notice. Um, and that could mean, you know, scrambling a crew, getting a flight halfway across the country, you're paying for repositioning fees. And what originally may have been a $10,000 flight is now $20,000. Um, a lot of programs will give you guaranteed recovery where, um, you know, Hey, Mr. Customer, I know you purchased a light jet. The only aircraft available on short notice now is now Gulfstream G6. We're footing the bill. Congratulations, you got a free upgrade. It's a great, you know, great phone call, much better than hearing you have to pay $10,000 the morning of your flight. Um, peak day travel. A lot of uh, programs will take their aircraft off the public market for peak day, or they may charge premiums for peak day. So just ask, you know, do you have a peak day schedule and what are the implications associated with this peak day travel? Increased costs, do I get priority aircraft, um, et cetera? Um, let's go through these a little quick so I don't want to drag on too long here. Uh, membership fees. A lot of programs have initiation fees. They have cancellation fees. They have monthly membership dues. Um, always ask, what are the fees associated with the program separate from what's flying? And if you really want to be, you know, kind of, a, you know, dig, you know, go into the numbers with it, you can take those numbers and amortize them over your amount of flying and see what the total cost of each program is. So initiation, cancellation, or monthly membership fees, always important to ask what these are, what are involved here. Uh, upgrades or downgrades. Sometimes when you buy a jet card, let's say you buy a 50 hour jet card, you may be locked into a mid-size jet. Um, and if you wanna upgrade or downgrade to a larger or smaller aircraft, you're paying a premium for it. You know, always ask your membership provider, what's the policy with upgrading and downgrading and what are the associated costs? Uh, cancellation policies. Everyone has that, you know, that story or knows of a story where somebody may have booked a non uh, flight that can't be canceled and then they try to get out of it the day before and they lose $15,000. Um, some programs are very rigid, you know, non-cancellation, non-flights uh, that can't be canceled. Uh, some are, you can cancel the day before and say, hey, I don't need this flight anymore, uh, day before, and you just walk away off the hook. So always ask, what's the cancellation policy for every single flight? Because international may be different than domestic, and it may be also different on which airplane you're on. Uh, we talked about catering. A lot of times they include catering, nice benefit. Lifestyle benefits, a lot of these programs um, are part of a third part, you know, they, they partner with resorts and hotels and 
um, you know, car dealerships. So what additional benefits come with the programs? Um, expiration of funds. Some of these uh, programs, you put funds on account and it's use it or lose it. If you don't use them within two years, they expire and they're done. Um, are there rollover periods? Um, do they expire, you know, et cetera? Uh, what's the pricing model? We talked about dynamic versus fixed rate. You can uh, ask, you know, with a specific program, how does that work? Is this a fixed rate program or is it dynamic? And lastly, and the most important, who owns the aircraft? Does the uh, membership that you're going with, do they have skin in the game? To become a broker, it's a very low bar for entry. All you need to do is sign up for the market software, pay a few hundred bucks a month, and you have access to, be, to the entire uh, market. Um, it is a very different experience if you partner with one of the companies, like one of these large ones, that has aircraft um, that, in, you know, that they have control over and they can provide to you versus you know, maybe brokers who only uh, work with you know, a small network of other um, providers. So once again, always ask who owns the aircraft, who's operating the aircraft. All right, so let's talk about safety. Um, the most important subject. When you work, a lot of the big names are already vetted. They've been around, they have a very good track record, very good safety record. Um, it's, it, it's not super critical that you dig into the weeds of a lot of these big companies. But if you're working with smaller independent brokers, independent one-off operators, um, you're going to want to ask these questions. In the industry, you're going to see three major rating, uh, major um, safety, uh, sorry, safety auditing agencies, uh, Wyvern, Argus, and ISBAO. And what the three of these programs do is they take the FAA minimums, the 135 standards we were talking about earlier, um, you know, the pilot airplane crew requirements, and then they elevate them even higher. And they say you have to have higher minimum standards for your pilots. You have to have a more rigorous uh, you know, maintenance schedule. You have to show us that you have a safety management program in place. Um, they will do on-site audit assessment. Um, they will do on-site audits of each one of these operators and verify you know, firsthand that they are a safe, sound, reliable operation. They have different levels. You're going to see under Wyvern, you're going to see two common levels. You're going to see uh, registered and you're going to see wingman. Under Argus, you're going to see gold, gold plus, and platinum. All that gold and registered mean is that the um, company has put, they've submitted their forms with the, um, with the agency and they um, you know, are in the system. So they've checked the background, checked the operational history, verified the aircraft are on schedule, but they haven't done any on-site audits. The on-site audits only come at the wingman and the uh, gold plus and platinum level. So not to say that a gold or registered isn't, um, you know, isn't safe. They certainly very well could be safe operators, but if you really want that peace of mind, um, you can ask, you know, specifically for a wingman certified or a platinum certified uh, operator. Uh, trip check and pass programs, these are specific to the individual flight. So before you take off, um, these auditing agencies can provide you uh, information in real time on the crew, on the conditions, uh, the operator, on the conditions of the aircraft, and um, make sure that everything is buttoned up and safe in advance of every specific flight. Um, beyond these three auditing agencies and the stamps of approval that you're looking for, just four big questions to check with, um, you know, the, either the jet card program, the membership, or the uh, operator. What's the age reputation of the company? That's really number one. Have they been around for a while? Are they a fly-by-night operation and they just have one aircraft? Um, you're really going to see the gamut. Second is pilot hours and experience. Um, are they experienced pilots who have flown to Aspen a million times, or are they brand new to the line and have only been on the aircraft for a few months? Uh, two PIC rated pilots. A lot of jets are single pilot certified. So it's always important to ask, are there going to be two pilots on this aircraft that they both certify to independently fly the aircraft? Um, and last but not least is the accident and his, in incident history. Uh, what's the track record of this operator uh, that you're working with? So big summary, we talked about a lot, and this is uh, you know, my second to last slide here. Um, how do you protect yourself? Um, like I, as I mentioned, there's horror stories of people getting an aircraft that are dilapidated, people having unsafe experiences, people who put up money and lose it, um, people who end up in a flight they can't cancel. These are nine guiding principles um, that I think are, you know, will make sure that you have a good experience every single time. First is if you are going to join a program or work with a broker, find a, rep, a reputable, well-established broker that will be there, um, you know, it's safe, they're sound, they're reliable, they're going to be there when you need them. Um, that's number one. Number two, avoid illegal charters. We talked about that. Um, if your friend has an aircraft, really not the best idea to you know, pay them on the side and, and use it. Uh, number three, ask for the certifications of the operator and crew. If you're working with a broker, who is the operator? Are they Argus Platinum? Are they Argus Gold? Are they Wyvern Registered Wingman? And can you give me a copy of the uh, trip check or the, um, the Wyvern Pass certificate before the flight? Uh, confirm the all-in uh, flight costs. A lot of operators or brokers will provide just the net cost and not tell you about any of the 
um, costs that come after the fact, the taxes, the fees, the landing fees, the overnights of the crew. So just understand, is this the all-in price you're looking at, or are there any additional expenses that could incur? Um, next is understand the aircraft you're getting. We talked about the different categories. Uh, make sure it fits your mission. Make sure it'll fit your cargo, it'll fit your passengers and all the such. Uh, next, confirm the flight cancellation terms. It's a 24 hour cancellation or the minute I wire the money, am I, is that it, I'm taking the flight. Uh, last, confirm the aircraft recovery options. What happens if things don't go as planned and the aircraft is unavailable? Am I gonna be liable to fit the bill or is my membership taken care of for me? Um, last, disclose all relevant mission information. Uh, we talked about that with the aircraft, but if you're planning on bringing two, uh, two surfboards, probably a good idea to let the operator know so they can get you a good aircraft for it. Uh, and lastly, if there's a belted lab in the aircraft, don't be the last person to board. You don't wanna be that person that's stuck in the back. Um, really will change the experience for you. So let's say you wanna take your next steps and you wanna book your first flight. Maybe you're just looking for a one-off flight or maybe you're actually looking to join a program and find a partnership for the long run. Um, very, very simple process. The first thing is to find a program or find yourself a broker. Um, as I mentioned, do your due diligence, check the, uh, the, uh, the, the history of them. If you ever want to use me as a resource, even if you want to go with a different company, I'm happy to provide my two cents. Um, every single broker, every operator tailors themselves to a specific type of client. So it's important to find something that fits your, uh, your individual needs. Um, second is to disclose your mission. As I mentioned, always talk with your broker, always talk with your, um, uh, you know, the, the membership or jet card provider that you have. Make sure that they fully understand what you're looking for in this flight. Um, are you flexible on times? Are you rigid on times? Passengers, cargoes, uh, requirements for the aircraft. Third is book your trip. This typically involves signing a contract and either putting a credit card uh, on hold for the deposit or wiring a portion of the funds up front. And then between the time that you book and the time that you actually have to go fly, um, you'll typically be in touch with your broker or the operator and they'll ask you about catering requests. They'll check to see all the passengers' name, information, passports. Um, you know, now with COVID considerations, you have to, and a lot of times you're traveling internationally, you have to provide um, you know, uh, proof of a negative COVID test. Uh, a good broker will know, you know, if you're traveling internationally, they'll know all the requirements and make sure you're not missing any paperwork. Because um, the last thing you want to show do is show up to the uh, to the airport that day and find out that you know you don't have the legal the documents required to fly. Um, and then, then the morning comes, uh, you know, your black car will pick you up from your house. They'll drop you off at the uh, FBO, which stands for fixed base operator. It's a private terminal. You're going to walk through the marble floor. There's going to be a Keurig. It's a fantastic experience. You're not dealing with security or any of that riffraff that comes in commercial air travel. Um, pilots check your IDs, they welcome you on the airplane, they take your luggage for you because in private aviation you do not carry your own luggage. Um, board the airplane and have a great experience and fly away. So with all that being said, you know, that finishes up the bulk of the presentation and at this point we're going to open up to questions. So Emily, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ari. This is so much information. For those of you who joined us a little late, um, we will be, we are recording today's session and we will be sharing a recording. Um, so keep an eye on your email inboxes for a recording. And now we already have some questions. So if you have a question for Ari, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we will ask. Um, the first question, which I think you answered um, very you know, comprehensively is about safety and maintenance record and what to ask for those standard inspection requirements. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has more drilled down safety questions, feel free to submit those now. Um, and then the next question is, you spoke earlier of smaller mom and pop jet shops. How common are those compared to the larger players in the private space in terms of market share? And do you see consolidation of these businesses in the future? Yeah, great. Um, so back to the safety question, you know, we touched on it before. Once again, look for those stamps of approval, look for Wyvern, look for Argus, um, look for ISBAO, and then um, ask to check the incident history, do they have a safe operation? Um, th that's really the high level um, that you, that you, questions you want to ask. Um, and typically, if they check off all those boxes, they're going to be a good safe operator. Um, uh, and then in terms of the mom and pop shops, uh, they, it is very heavily skewed toward mom and pop shops. Um, I don't know the exact statistic. I have Gordon Cameron, he works with me and he comes from a, he used to work at Textron actually. He might know the exact numbers um, on this split, but it is very heavily skewed toward the individual mom and pop shops. Um, Gordon, do you know the exact um, breakdown between in the industry right now? Yeah, the top 10 operators in the space equal about 45% of all flight hours flown. Um, so it is heavily skewed towards kind of these independent small operators. 
Um, as the industry matures and progresses, uh, we are in a mode of consolidation right now. So I expect the, the mom and pop shops to uh, slowly dissipate and, and some of these major players in the space uh, really grow through acquisition and gain market share that way. Yeah, as, as demand is you know coming back up um, and really ramping up fast, there's, as Gordon mentioned, there is a rapid rush to acquire aircraft. So we're seeing a ton of acquisitions in the industry in the last, um, in the last few months, especially. Um, which, you know, can be viewed as a positive or a negative. You're losing the little guys. But on the other hand, a lot of, um, they're creating a lot of standardization. They're improving safety um, across these typical mom and pop shops and gaining efficiencies through, um, you know, through scale. So I, I think that as the industry progresses, it's going to keep on getting more and more consolidated. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then can you tell us about the differences between the membership or jet card companies? I think maybe that relates to my question I asked you earlier, like a service like JSX um, or, or the differences between the membership or jet card companies. Yeah. So memberships and jet cards to kind of explain the difference between these. Uh, think of a membership like a country club membership. You pay your annual dues and you have access to, or you prefer access to all the services and benefits um, that come with these programs. That can mean preferred access to, or priority access to the owned fleet of the provider. Um, it could be guaranteed recovery, et cetera. Um, that's the membership side. On a jet card side, what you're typically doing is you're buying a non-refundable block of hours. So you're gonna buy, 25 hours in a light jet at X hourly rate. You're gonna buy 50 hours, um, you know, non-refundable at X hourly rate, and you have to use them in two years or to such. Each, each uh, program has their own. Um, if you are looking to go into any, any one of these, I would always recommend finding a program that owns aircraft versus um, finding one through a brokerage because where a broker doesn't own the aircraft, they may be pre-selling you blocks of hours. They're now going out and just hedging their bets they can find an aircraft at a lower rate. Um, so similar concept that you get uh, similar benefits on both of them. Um, like I said, priority access to a fleet, um, you know, uh, preferred cancellation or recovery terms, you know, catering credits, et cetera. But one of them operates in a membership based model where once you're paying your annual dues, you have the benefits. The other one is typically you, you buy a set number of hours that have to be used. Um, and then uh, you actually also mentioned JSX. So yeah. I'll touch on that a little bit. This um, kind of goes into the world of shared charters. You might hear about some of these companies that offer uh, shared or public charters under what's called Part 380. And um, the way this works is that if you are under the minimum, um, a certain number of uh, passengers, you don't need to go through TSA. You don't need to go through, um, you know, all the, the typical commercials. So you might see 16 passenger shuttles that operate up and down the coast of California or up and down the coast of uh, you know, New York to, to Florida. So my company, XO, we do this on the East Coast. JSX is a similar provider. They do it on the West Coast. And you can buy an individual seat, an individual seat on a shared, um, a shared shuttle for you know, maybe you know, $1,000, $2,000. Great. Thank you, Ari. Um, and with some of these programs, is there a standard definition for light, mid, super mid, large? For example, um, I see many jet card programs offering smaller jets in what should be larger jet classes. For example, a Lear 45 as a mid. It is, it is definitely a gray zone. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll see a Citation XL be considered, uh, Lear 45 as a mid is a little bit of a stretch in my opinion. That's, that's <laughs> like a little bit rich. That's, you know. It sounds like this sure. um, The Lear 60 is probably closer to mid in my opinion. But once again, like, yeah, it, it is definitely a gray zone. Um, I will see one, one place will advertise a Citation Excel as a super light jet and another will advertise it as a mid. So I think rather than, um, it, it's probably more important than um, knowing exactly what category it falls under is to understand which aircraft do you like, do you favor, and which program will allow you to fly on those aircraft. So, so if, you love, if you love Lear 45s um, and, and the price they're offering for it is great, then it's, you know, it's a slam dunk. If they're trying to charge you an armor like for a Lear 45 and you know you don't you want a super mid aircraft, they're like, oh, no, but a Lear 45 is definitely a super mid aircraft. Um, you know, probably not the best program. So, but long answer short, it's somewhat subjective with pretty good guidelines. Great. 
Um, back to your most popular question. Could you speak a little bit to the finances in the industry? For example, what's the profit margin and where do companies look to cut costs? Is growth more about growing sales or increasing prices? Man, this is a deep question. It's a good one. Um, and I think the answer to it in turn is going to be very, it's going to be very um, tailored toward each individual operator. Um, there are operators that will, their priority is margin. They're going to offer a 12 out of 10 experience. They're going to charge, and they're going to charge you an armor like that price. Um, I think of, you know, our parent, our, our sister company, VistaJet, um, you can look them up. They are not definitely not the cheapest operator. Um, but, you know, all of their flight attendants, you know, go get trained at the Butler School in London, and that is the experience you're going to be getting. Um, probably a higher margin than some operator who may have a very similar Challenger 350 kept in mediocre condition, just trying to charge the lowest price possible to get as many hours in as possible. Um, it really comes down to depreciation schedule. Um, you know, the cost of fuel, you're getting the cost of fuel. The cost of a pilot, it's market rate. There's a lot of costs that are going to be standardized across the level of the industry. Um, and each operator is different. But you may, one of the places you actually might see people cut corners, and this is, um, is on safety and on, um, you know, and on maintenance, it's, it's a reality of the industry. And that's one of the reasons that you want to look for certified operators. Um, to get an Argus uh, rating, it's not cheap. You're paying a pretty big premium for it. Um, and that's why some operators may only have one certification. Some of them may work with all three. Um, but, you know, people try to cut corners, uh, try to cut corners anywhere, um, you know, safe, safety included. So it's always important to know the operator and know how, how they're operating their aircraft and, and the pilots they're hiring. Um, are these, you know, experienced pilots that are paying a good salary to, or are these brand new pilots that are trying to, you know, get a low ball offer on? Great, and uh, we've had several pre-submitted questions and we have a question now live about the impact on COVID and the private flying industry. So can you speak yeah. a little bit about that and what you think, which trends might continue or what you might see, you know, in a year or two? Yeah, so the industry as a whole, commercial and private, all travel alike, you know, back in uh, March of 2020, it, it tanked, um, it went right down. Demand fell off the charts. You know, we saw a lot of mom and pop shops close. A lot of airlines shut down. Um, the entire industry was in disarray. Uh, since then, things have rapidly, rapidly recovered. Um, private industry actually much faster than commercial commercial aviation. Um, and I think that's for two reasons. One, as there was a large shift of people who came from commercial and said, "I don't want to deal with, you know, having you know 300 people on my flight and I have to go through security. I have to sit in the waiting in the terminal for so long." So we saw a lot of people who used to fly commercial first class shift over to private aviation. That's one category. Um, number two, it was much easier to fly around private than it was commercial, um, as you can still go ahead and charter an aircraft versus limited schedules. So uh, private industry you know, didn't take as hard of a hit. Uh, that being said, it's already pretty much rebounded, and I think it's, it's really continuing to skyrocket. Um, you know, One of the questions that we have is, well, people who came over to you just during the pandemic because they didn't want to fly commercial, are they going to go back to commercial? It's, I think it's two very different experiences. People who fly private, not because they're looking for more leg room and they're looking for an extra fruit cup. Um, they're flying private because they want a black car to pick them up from their house. It's going to drop them off at the airport where the airplane has been waiting for them for two hours. They're going to walk through a marble terminal, walk on their airplane. The minute they're on the airplane, the door closes. They soar at 41,000 feet above the rest of the you know, traffic um, and they land at their destination. It's super fast, super efficient. Um, and I think that people who value that will continue to fly private. Um, so, and it's also sticky. It kind of spoils you. Once you go on a private jet, it, it's tough to go back to, you know, jet blue. <laughs> so, um, but I do, I do think the industry is going to continue to grow. I think as travel continues to return, um, you're only going to see more and more growth. Um, given that it is somewhat sticky, I, I think a lot of the people who have switched over, I think there will definitely be some who will return back to first class. Um, but I think there'll be a number that's, that'll stay. Great. Um, this question is a little bit different. Do you still need visas for international flights when required to those destinations when you're flying on a private jet? You will. So when you fly internationally, you're still going to have to go through customs. Um, so you're still going to have to submit copies of your passports. You're still going to have to, you know, clear customs. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen airplanes land in Vermont coming from Canada and they'll take a, um, a radiation detector to walk around the aircraft. 
Um, and then, but it's, pre it's pretty much somewhat a quick process. You know, it's, it's a separate customs from the rest. So yes, you will still need, you know, visas, you will still need passport verification. Um, even in some cases, we've seen requirements where if you're traveling with children who are not traveling with parents, you'll need notarized forms from both parents to, you know, verify that the child can travel on their own and stuff like that. So it's same, same uh, level of restrictions. Great. What are, for baby people who are in an upper middle class or middle class, rather than just those upper echelon classes, what are the strategies to try to make private flight options more accessible or more affordable? Um, so the, the two answers that I would say here, and uh, Emily, I know you touched on this earlier with J companies like JSX or like mine with EXO, um, you can try doing the shared, uh, shared shuttles. So for example, we operate shuttles going between New York and South Florida. And I know JSX on the West Coast has op shuttles operating around. Um, these are typically 16 passenger shuttles. Um, you're going through the private terminal. So it's kind of that half-half experience where you're not just going through commercial. Um, but if you want to see what it's kind of like, you know, just getting on a small airplane, the private airport going point A to point B and done. Uh, number two is empty legs. Uh, so remember we were talking about the, you know, the, the based aircraft that have to return back home. Well, when they go and drop off their passenger and they have to go back home, that's considered an empty leg. Um, those are typically sold on the market at a fraction of the cost. Um, I mean, I put on my, my one of my clients, uh, I got them on a flight from New York down to Florida for like $6,000 in like a, a, a good mid-sized aircraft um, just because the operator had to move it. Um, and they were like, yeah, we'll just give it away pretty much for free because, you know, go for it. Um, the downside to empty legs, and this is a big caveat, you are essentially beholden to the other person's schedule. So the flight can cancel. Um, they're typically non-refundable. So don't expect to have flexibility in this, um, but you can get some really, really good deals. So if you ever need empty legs, there's plenty of places, um, you know, you can look at them online. I'm happy to give resources for that. And um, it's, it's a cool place to see if you can get a cheap flight on occasion. Cool. Yeah, you have to be a real risk taker, I imagine. You can. Uh, um, some empty legs are also sold by the seat. So you might even be able to get, I mean, I think the cheapest I've ever seen was be, seats between, uh, you know, New York and, um, and Chicago being sold for like $400 or something like that. So it's not, it's not unheard of, but it's rare. Great. Um, a couple of questions about your company specifically that you work for. What is kind of the target com type of customer that you are, have come to XO and what's the marketing strategy like? Like, where are you advertising your services uh, to get those clients? Yeah, so EXO um, is actually, a, it's, it's actually a merger between a number of different companies. So we were EXO Jet Aviation, Reverend Aviation, uh, Jet Smarter, which is an app um, for booking flights. And we all rolled in together under the Vista Global Holding Company. So we actually have a mobile app that you can download and you can just browse around. You don't have to pay for it or anything. Just put in your email address. Um, I apologize if, you know, if somebody reaches out to you, it might be even be me. Um, but just put in your email address and you can just actually browse flights and see what it costs. Say I'm going from Boston to Chicago and just, you know, look at what it costs in a light jet, look at what it costs in the midsize. It's pretty cool to, to shop around. Um, so a lot of people, they download the app and they browse through there. Um, and the, pretty much the majority of clients that we're looking for, we see people who, just as I mentioned, we're a membership based program. So we are looking for, you know, our, our clients don't care to sink $3 million into, or I should say a lot of our clients don't, don't care to buy an aircraft but they want protections afforded of being part of a membership. So that's sort of where we fall in. Um, we do also see some clients who own their own aircraft and want what's called supplemental lift. So maybe if their aircraft is down for maintenance or it's being used by you know, a, another partner in a firm, they'll use us for their supplemental lift. So like I said, it's individuals looking just to charter around or we see people who have other programs and want you know, ours as well because we may have preferential uh, rates on, on a certain routing. I imagine there's a lot of word of mouth um, referrals as well. There is a lot, a lot of word of mouth. Um, yeah, a lot of word of mouth. You know, the app. We we do events on occasion throughout the country. Um, you know, less so with COVID, um, but those are going to be ramping up soon again. So if we do want to up in New York or Boston or anywhere around here, you can let us know. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to end for today, since we ended talking about the company that you represent. Is there anything final that you'd like to leave our audience with today, Ari? Uh, no, that, I mean, that's all. Thanks again for having me, Emily. But, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a fellow alum here. Like, it's, it's, it's a really pleasure to kind of, you know, contribute back and be back here with, with the group. Um, you know, my contact information is here. And I just want to say, use me as a resource, you know, as an open door. I'm happy to talk about, you know, our programs, any other programs in the market, and really give my two cents um, to, to kind of help guide people. 
Excellent. Thank you. Well, again, we'll provide the recording from today's session as well as Ari's contact information so you can reach out directly if that's of interest to you. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon.